Hi, we are live. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Be Waste Wife. I am Shweta Vandapani. I'm the community builder at Be Waste Wife. And uh, we organize webinars and we have been organizing webinars in the space of waste and sustainability for since 2013, actually, since very much pre-COVID. So, and we try to bridge the knowledge gap that is available, that, that's there in this field by and large. And today, the topic of today's webinar is consumers and their ability to deliver decarbonization. And uh, well, the focus is going to be on societies which are more consumption led. We have Adam Reed, who's the director of external affairs at Suez Recycling and Recovery. He is moderating this webinar. If you have not seen other webinars he's moderated or participated in, please head to the video panel section on our website and you will find them all there. And Adam is going to talk to David Greenfield, founder and MD at Social Environmental and Economic Solutions. Trevin Resterick, at founder and CEO at Hubbub UK, and Stephen Clark, head of communications at TerraCycle and Loop Europe. We have received uh, the questions that you had put in along with your registration. We've already passed it to the panel. And uh, if, if your questions are still not answered, please use the Q&A section. Adam will make sure that the questions are passed on to the panelists. And uh, that's, that's pretty much it. Over to you, Adam. Thank you, Sweta, and good afternoon or good evening or good morning, depending on where you are around the globe today. Um, it's good to see so many of you joining, and I see the numbers are going up by the moment, so more of you are, are coming on stream. Um, an e excellent panel today. Um, some, some friends, some colleagues, uh, some experts, all experts, I, 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 I hasten to add. Um, and I think this topic is, I mean, this is a topic that I can have, have a conversation with my mum and my son um, and all the experts that I, that I you know, work with and, and, and discuss online with um, at the same time, because it, it's so relevant and prevalent and important. And, and I think, you know, today's session is not about how do we decarbonize or what is net carbon zero? I don't want to get into the technology too much. I don't want to get into the, to the rhetoric. But what I do want to focus on is how aware are public consumers and businesses of the transition that we're going to need to to embrace and how can we as experts and people working in this sector who understand it and and really get what the transition looks like how can we help bring consumers and businesses with us because if it takes us 5 10 15 years to get people to believe and I'm, I'm a bit worried that you know blue planet effect and david attenborough for all the press that it got still hasn't convinced some people that you know, this is real. Um, and there's still COVID deniers around the world. Um, and, and, and if that's the case, climate change, well, maybe it's not real. So how is it we're going to get everybody or most of the people most of the time, because I'm probably going to be satisfied with that. That's, that's, that's a reasonable expectation to a point where they're doing the right things. They're playing their part and that enables the rest of the system to do its part properly. So today we've got some, some real experts and, and I apologize for the diversity on the panel, um, but we have got two bald men and two hairy men. So hopefully that, that ticks a few boxes, but you know, the invita invitations went out to a host of other speakers and experts and just diaries and didn't quite align. So today it's experts first and foremost. So with David, with Truin and with, with, with Stephen, we've got some very different experiences, whether it be consumer focus, whether it be tr technology transition, whether it be about the policy space, or it be simply around nudge, encouragement and support. So I'm going to let each of them speak for four or five minutes and, and give their perspective on how we take consumers on a carbon neutral journey, or even a carbon positive journey if, if we want to push the boat out. And, and what is it that we need to do, you know, to help them over the next, let's say, 15 years to make sure that we build on the momentum that, you know, we may have seen during COVID, you know, how many of us are not driving as much? How many of us are shopping locally? How many of us are doing more exercise? How many of us, you know, the list goes on. Um, I even thought about going vegan the other week. Um, so there you go. You know, we're constantly thinking about these issues that if we all make small changes, there's a, there's, there's a lot of positivity that, that could happen. But you know, post post COVID and, and the likely recovery is going to see some of us challenge with new norms and possibly old norms. And I just wonder whether old habits die hard and how do we embrace those new habits? So we're going to kick off with David, uh, David Greenfield. He'll tell you exactly what he does for a living uh, and, and what he thinks about this issue. So, David, how are you? I'm very well. Thank you, Adam. Yourself? No, I'm all right, mate. I'm all right. You've got five minutes. You've got loads of slides, but they're going to be very visual. So they hopefully are. the audience will stick with us. And remember, questions, send them in. I'm picking them up and I will make sure I use them at the right points in the conversation. Thank you. David. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Adam. 
And uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm David. I'm a Chartered Waste Manager, a fellow of CIWM and a Chartered um, RSA as well, fellow of the RSA. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit, if I can get the slides to go forward, about carbon. We're doing OK, but we've come from a very high point. CO2s are lower than they were in 1888. Uh, we need to get a lot lower. Um, World Resources Institute put this really useful diagram together. It very, very quickly shows you we need to accelerate the acceleration of decarbonisation. More renewables, more electric vehicles, more tree cover, more coal power, uh, less coal power even. Um, low carbon fuels and we need to electrify. These are the things that the states and the governments need to do. What can consumers do? A couple of really useful things. Um, I've been working in energy efficiency and renewables and waste management for 20 years now. The, the diagram on the right hand side is something that we can all do if we don't already do ourselves. Turn off the lights, take the stairs, power down your laptops, everything that will make a small little bit of difference. You've then got some other bigger impacts. Um, most of us have been living car free over the last 12 months. Um, some of us will have an electric car. Very few of us will have done any long haul flights over the last year. Um, hopefully most of us on this will be using renewable energy. Public transport, all of these things are really quite good. As Adam said, moving to a vegan diet. Um, I think where we are, my background is waste management, resource management, refurbishment, renovation is one of the big areas. I'll tell you a little bit about that in a second. But there's confusion or slightly different messages depending on where you look at what people can do. Now, a lot. this is another example from uh, environmental research. Um, mirrors quite a lot of what you saw on the previous slide. The one thing that isn't on the previous slide, which shows the biggest, biggest uh, contribution to uh, reducing carbon emissions is to have less children. Now, there is a correlation between, I suspect there is a correlation between COVID and having less children, and it's gonna go the other way, um, which in itself could, could mean that COVID, whilst all of the other factors like living car free and less transatlantic flat flights, might mean that we end up with a higher carbon uh, output as a result of having more kids as a result of COVID and lockdown. A speculation rather than anything else. Um, but there's also different information. And those of you who know me that I like to look at detail. So this is a really good example of Actually, you need to understand what you're doing and understand the detail that sits behind it. We all know that meat eaters produce more carbon than uh, vegan. Those of you that eat chocolate, who knew that um, uh, you could actually have chocolate that is more impactful than some forms of beef? Start to understand what's out there and start to move to low carbon consumption as an example. Um, I did my own personal footprint and it looks quite good. Um, I don't travel too much. Um, my biggest contribution is from the home, which I was quite surprised at. Um, but from a work perspective, we've been doing something over the last 12 months and I'm just going to play you a very short uh, 45 second video just to show that I think from a waste management and resource management perspective, there are new opportunities. And one of those is how we actually go about collecting resources for reuse. This is what we're doing in Brighton and Hove. And uh, this might be something for the future. I saw Adam bopping away to that. Very catchy that, may, that may be 
the solution for future material collections, but we do need to look at ways we can capture materials. You as individuals need to understand what you're currently doing. Scare yourself and make a difference. You have the choice. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> Thank you, David. Um, some, some great graphics in there, by the way, which is always a good start to a webinar um, for those that are, uh, are watching carefully. You know, some I, I think you're, you know, the personal carbon footprint. I did mine a while back and it kind of shocked me. Um, it's significantly different now because of COVID and, and, and how we've restructured our lives. But, you know, that isn't permanent, I don't think. So it's quite interesting. I, was, I just want to share this on my screen, if you can see this. This was a report that came out just the other day. So this is um, people's climate vote. It's a result from a UNDP Oxford University report. And what it said was um, that everybody, you know, 80, 90 percent of the, of the public asked in, on every continent, in every country of every age is saying we need to do more. We need more policy. We need more, we need more activity. We, we, we need more leadership. Yet most of it says nothing about I'll do more. And, and, I, and I think it's interesting, Dave, you've, you've raised a very good point there that we can all make a little bit of difference. And I don't want to undermine the need for government policy, the, the right regulations and the empowerment that comes from, from centralised thinking. But we've still got to all do a bit more. So there's going to be some questions coming your way in a moment, Dave, because people have started to, to get active. But uh, before we do, I'm, I'm going to run down the list. So I think uh, we've got Stephen up next. Um, Stephen Clark from TerraCycle and Loop here in the UK. And, and you're going to look at this from a completely different perspective, um, focusing on sort of that consumer, that, that retail environment. Stephen, how are you? I'm good. Thank you very much. Good. Welcome. The floor's yours, mate. Thank you very much. If you can uh, start the presentation. Lovely. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to look from a slightly different perspective. So I'm, I'm Steve Clark. I'm the head of communications at, um, at TerraCycle and Loop. I'm going to focus during this part here on the, on the reuse side rather than the recycling side. So and for anyone who doesn't know what Loop is, I'm going to give you a quick intro. It's a zero waste shopping platform aimed at eliminating waste and greatly improving the delivery design and features of products. Um, via Loop, the consumers have the ability to consume and responsibly dispose of uh, products in reusable durable packaging that's then collected, cleaned, refilled and reused. So the consumer doesn't importantly own the package. They pay a deposit on it, which is returned once they return the packaging. Um, all they own is the, uh, is, is the product. So if you, if you buy shampoo, do you want the bottle or do you want the shampoo? I'm assuming you just want the shampoo. Um, it, it's kind of, we, we look at it as the milkman reimagined. Re re it's um, disposable packaging, making um, shopping, delivery and reuse convenient. And if you move to the next slide, I think this, this is my main, my main point of today. There's, there's various um, routes to market that we're, we're going to have via loop. The more convenient we make reuse, the bigger the uh, amount of consumers who will get on board with it and will actually use it. So up until now, I think it's fair to say that zero waste has been, has been pretty niche. Um, zero waste shops are, are small in number um, and, and pretty hard to find. Uh, choice has been limited. There's a, only a, a kind of a, a pretty limited choice you can get in most small reuse shops. Um, you have to take your own containers, you have to queue, you have to refill it yourself and, and clean your own containers. And as a result, it's not convenient for the consumer. And that's why not enough reuse goes on. The key to making reuse um, work at a, at a mass scale is convenience. And that's exactly what we're aiming to do with Loop. So there's, there's different models, which I'll, I'll kind of run you through. If you move on to the next one, please, Sweater. So this is what's currently live and, and has been live in the UK um, since July uh, 2020. You can order products via, via our own website. So we've basically set up as our own retailer at loopstore.co.uk. And there's a selection of some of the, the well-known branded products you can buy via the service at the moment. Um, we, we deliver it to you uh, in, in the reusable loop tote that you can see. You consume the products as normal. Once you've finished, um, you, uh, you schedule a collection. We come and collect it. It's then uh, cleaned, refilled by the manufacturers, and it goes off to the next consumer. So you're only paying a deposit on the container. Um, once you have returned it, you get that back. Um, to be accepted onto the Loop platform, a, a container has to be reused a minimum of 10 times and anywhere up to 100 plus. Um, the reusable containers have a lower environmental footprint because they're being reused time and time again. If you look at, it, at the amount of energy that's used to create it for the first time, yes, it's more than a disposable product, but the aim is to have them used multiple times. And so then it is a much better impact on the, uh, on the environment. If you, um, if you can move on to the next slide. 
Um, this is this is the next phase for Loop in the UK. So we launched this um, in uh, in France in Q4. So in France, we've been live a little bit longer. Um, we, we had our own uh, website uh, platform to begin with, um, a boutique Loop, and that's now been transitioned uh, into our, our retail partner Carrefour. So you can now order things via Carrefour's uh, e-commerce site. And in December, our first stores uh, went live. So we now have 10 stores live in, uh, in the greater Paris region where you can go in and pick the shelves, uh, the products directly off the shelf, and you can also return it into the smart bin provided. So the, the, the key for Loop is making it as relevant for as many people in as many different places that they go to as possible. So if you move on to the next slide. What we are ultimately aiming to do is make reuse feel like disposability. So whilst Tesco, for example, is our retail partner in the UK, over time, um, we see Loop as, a, as an engine for, for reuse. You'll, you'll hopefully see it in multiple retailers. Uh, we also made an announcement towards the end of last year that we're going to be doing a pilot in McDonald's restaurants for reusable coffee cups. And so the ultimate aim is, if you can imagine, imagine you, you do your shopping at Tesco and a few days later you go to a McDonald's restaurant. You could then drop back any empty packaging to that McDonald's restaurant or vice versa. If you, um, if you uh, go to a McDonald's restaurant and you take a, have a takeaway coffee in your reusable cup and then you go and do your shopping at Tesco, you'd be able to drop it back to the Tesco store. So th this for us is, is really the big thing. We have to move reuse from niche to mainstream. And the way we do that is make it as easy, as convenient, and as price comparable for the consumer as disposability. Um, and so that's, that's me. A um, little quick overview for anyone who doesn't know Loop. And uh, on to, back to you, Adam. Thanks, Stephen. I, I, I always love hearing about Loop. Um, I just think the concept just, just seems to grab me as being so obvious and yet why haven't we been doing it before? And actually, a lot of the questions and commentary that's been coming back, a lot, lot of love in the room for it. Um, I've got, got a question. I've got a question. One thing, one thing actually, I silly forgot to mention is we are going to be launching into the first Tesco stores, like I've just shown you the examples of the Carrefour stores later this year. So exciting things to come for us this year. There you so. go. Hot off the press. Um, what's, um, can you work with the local authorities? A um, lot of people, you know, I think that question gets asked a lot and it's not always an easy answer, but, you know, give us a, how do you interface with the public sector? Um, we, we don't currently have any, any, anything in, in the pipeline. I mean, we, we started off with, with retail. So you've got Carrefour here uh, in France, you've got Tesco for the UK, we've got Walgreens and Kroger for, for the US. We're going to launch later this year with, uh, with other retailers. So Loblaws coming up in Canada, Aeon's coming up in Japan. We've got these other routes to market like uh, Ulta, which is a high-end beauty retailer in the US. We've got a McDonald's that I mentioned. We've also got a similar pilot coming up with Burger King. So there are other routes to market that are possible. I don't know what it could mean for, for, for councils, but yeah, in, in theory, the, the more um, routes to market we have and the more ways consumers can interact and drop off their containers, the, the better. So yeah, we're very interested in exploring those routes. I, I, I mean, I think, you know, <clears throat> my mum went online shopping for the first time during COVID. So, you know, the, here's a shift in behaviour that I thought was, you know, she loved the experience of pondering down the aisle and picking up stuff that she never knew she needed because it captured her attention. And I think suddenly now she's buying exactly what she wants and getting it when she needs it. And she's gone, I'm never going back. And, and, I, and I think, you know, sort of a loop approach really plays to that kind of demographic who may be, would never have shopped online before, but COVID has kind of encouraged them to, to be different. All consumers are different. So some will prefer to do e-commerce shopping and some will prefer to go and, you know, the physical bricks and mortar, picking it off the shelf. So that's, that's what we're aiming to do. We're aiming to, to have both, both sides covered and other routes. So it's easy to get and it's easy to drop it off. Okay, now I've got a tough question for you because, you know, today's about decarbonisation. So, you know, a, a few of our uh, learned audience are quite interested in the carbon footprint. You yeah. talked about 10 times round and, 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 and that's, that's the kind of the benchmark you need for your, your packaging. I mean, do, is, is that evidence, you know, corroborated? Are you comfortable now that you know what the, the life cycle benefits are and aren't of, of, the, of the system? It, it's going to depend on the different route to market. So it, it, it's it's different if you look at it from a, an e-commerce perspective to looking at, at a bricks and mortar. And and yes, it does it does take more energy to to create a durable pack than it does a disposable. But the the LCAs we've carried out so far, and we've got more ongoing, show that a reusable um, loop container um, has the same impact at two cycles as a disposable. 
um, and then anything anything over that it, it has a it has a positive impact so um, at five cycles the loop model saves 50 percent of environmental impacts so but it, it it kind of depends on the type of material so that is on a shampoo bottle for instance okay cool and so a similar question back to you david um carbon footprint you know you're looking at some of these niche materials you talked about sort of you know we take back or ca capture i love the idea of i mean Stephen talked about convenience and you're going to go and collect stuff from people when they want a collection of yeah. material that otherwise ends up in a drawer for for five years and and and, and nobody knows where it should go is there is are you comfortable that you know that your collection system is going to be carbon neutral or is it electric vehicle led how does that work yeah it's um we, we launched on the 12th of november uh we've got an electric vehicle uh we've set up our own data erasure system and this is really important because we're dealing with people's data when we're taking back laptops smartphones uh tablets uh, we're actually now taking them and giving them to school kids and families so that they can get access during COVID, um, which is the whole ultimate cycle for us. If we can collect a couple of laptops, a toaster and a kettle from one household, bring it back, data erase it, give it a new operating system via an electric van and then drop it off at a family that needs some of those items. That for me is true reuse. We've, uh, as I said, we launched in November. We've collected from 546 families already, 10.6 um, tonnes of small electricals, um, which averages 18.46 kilograms per household, which Adam, as you know, I like my stats. I can tell you that we've had 301 laptops and we've had 468 smartphones. Um, as, a, as a system, it is quite a labour intensive system, but what we're doing is trying to respect the materials that were put into the original products and to give them an extended life. Um, yeah, we're, we've, we've got a huge amount of love from residents in Brighton and Hope for this and beyond uh, Brighton and Hope. We've had people asking us to um, come and collect their electricals from Liverpool. Um, I'm sure the carbon footprint's not quite as easy. Well, exactly. And, and this is where actually it is about local solutions because there are other providers out there. I think we are quite unique in that this is the first app-based doorstep collection service. Um, there's a lot of work to do in terms of mapping some of this out, but I think there is the con convenience thing. We are able to offer residents a, a time slot where we're going to come and pick up their materials. Um, you don't get that from many other uh, material solution providers. Fair point. Good point. Um, can I just remind those of you in the audience that are absolutely hurling stuff at me, which is great. Can you put it in the question and answers box, not the chat box, because otherwise I need three screens. Just make my life a bit easier. Thank you. Um, this is brilliant. So you've, 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 Steve has talked about convenience and you've now started talking about, you know, usability in the public, which means I can bring true in because you are Mr. Behavior change. You're Mr. Nudge. You're Mr. Nerdle. You're Mr. Encourage, empower, support. So hello, true in. How are you? Yeah, I'm very good, Adam. How are you doing? I'm all right, mate. Thank you for joining me. It's always a pleasure when I, when I, when I get to share a, a platform with you. Um, Coming in, Hubbub's been at the forefront of nudging, you know, encouraging, supporting residential behavioural change, you know, from your, your crazy litter scheme in, uh, in, in Leeds, which I love, to, um, to all sorts of uh, you know, community-based, you know, fridges and other, uh, and other stuff that's brilliant. So tell me, are the public ready for this? And are you helping take those that weren't on the journey? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Adam. Uh, I haven't got any slides because I didn't want to do a sort of second rate sort of government COVID briefing of next slide, please. So, um, so sorry, you just stuck with a, a middle aged old bloke on the screen. But um, just sort of to talk about where the public's at. Um, we've been doing loads of polling at Hubbub uh, since lockdown started. So we've done five lots of polling of the general public just to find what the mood is. Uh, I thought it'd be quite useful just just to summarise where, where people are at. I mean, obviously, first of all, COVID sort of created a totally unexpected disruption to everybody's lives. And I think what we've seen is that actually it showed the impact of when lots of people change their behaviour all at once, what, what can happen. And actually, people liked that change. You know, they liked the fact there was less air pollution. Uh, they liked the fact that they were sort of 
could hear the birds again and you know that there was there was less congestion around so people actually that forced break showed what collective action could do and and people a lot of people want to keep it in fact most of the polling we've done shows that people don't want to go back to the old norm so so there is a real opportunity for significant change but i think what we also saw was that covid has impacted people very differently you've got you know your people making a sour bread out there and sort of endlessly talking about it on social media and then about half the population really really struggling with you know can i afford to get food on the table you know what what's happening financially to the household i don't feel secure anymore and i think any environmental communications has to realize that 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 we need to really bring everybody who's struggling financially along with us so what we're seeing is you know a lot more people are cooking at home food waste has suddenly become really an important issue people are like thinking about reducing food waste uh, we have a network of community fridges which redistribute food uh, fresh food via fridges and and that service has just grown and grown uh, a bit like david we're working with o2 to redistribute uh, and use smartphones so we've got a community calling campaign redistributing 10,000 smartphones to those people who are digitally isolated so I think if if we're going to get anywhere, we have to link the social uh, with the environmental. Um, we've also seen that although people want to change, the systems around them have to make it easy for them to change. So although everybody loved the fact that there was cleaner air, a lot of people don't want to get back onto public transport for safety reasons. Sale of secondhand cars is rocketing. So you know we have to make it provide the systems that make it as easy as possible for everybody to get involved. So, you know, Zoom is obviously a great way of people connecting without having to travel so far. Uh, we're definitely seeing electrification happening really quickly. Uh, the concept of the 15 minute city where you can get everything you need in a, within 15 minute walking is starting to build at a policy level. So we need that systemic change. Uh, I think we need to think about the language. So, you know, when you're in the middle of a pandemic, is the language of extinction rebellion the right language at the moment? Or, Certainly all the research we've done is suggests that people want something which is more relevant to their daily lives and, and something that they can grasp rather than another existential uh, threat uh, in the future. Um, I know you joked about the panel, but diversity is a massive issue for the environmental organisations. You know, it's still seen as the, the province of the muesli belt. You know, we've got to prove that environmental action is cost effective, it is cheap. We have to bring in more ethnic and diverse voices you know, look at the power of the BLM movement, you know, that's that's missed out on a lot of the environmental stuff. And I think the final thing I want to say is that the only way we're going to get there is through collaboration. Uh, a lot of the schemes that, that we've run that you mentioned, like the LEED scheme, it brings together public bodies, corporates of all sectors and the public. Uh, and we've, we've got to realise that it's just through that collaboration uh, that, that we achieve great things uh, rather than sort of siloed marketing campaigns or siloed thinking. So, so in short, COVID shows what can happen if people change. There is a receptivity to change, um, but we just need to grasp this moment and, uh, and there is a danger we won't. Thank you, Trina. It's a really wise words in there and a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a warning, perhaps, that, you know, we do have an opportunity, but if we don't get it right, <clears throat> we could find ourselves, you know, decades behind again, and we don't really have decades to play with. Um, Important points, collaboration, convenience, uh, language, inclusivity. I think they're all great points. Um, so a question for all of you, um, reflecting some of what's coming in from the, from the audience at the moment and a couple of things that came in um, pr 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 prior to, this, to, to the webinar today. Where should responsibility lie? Because, you know, a lot of people challenge me and say, look, we, the government need to set the rules and, you know, enforce this and enforce that. Other people are telling me it's all about brands. They're just not doing enough. They, you know, they, they comply. They need, they need to restrict, you know, their, 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 um, their products for all their packaging. So that only good options exist. We don't want any of these bad options or, or, or is it all about consumers just, consuming properly you know and, and, and i know you could all go oh it's a bit of all of that adam of course it is, it's collaboration but you know if you had to kind of you know put your money on one zone pushing forward quicker to really make this work where where would it be david i think we have to look at government setting the right policy framework um, is that uk government or global government i think it's global um that 
in in a way, the UK is a leader. Um, I say that given everything that's happened with Brexit and uh, uh, the EU, and even just having discussions yesterday around uh, whether or not AstraZeneca should be giving the um, vaccine to Europe, for example. But I think what we've done, and I. I'm going to just try this very quickly. If none of you have got this um, app, I would just recommend it for one little uh, example. This is the uh, GB Grid Carbon Intensity app, which is live. This shows you how much energy we're using and where it's sourced from. And you can see at the moment, nearly 20% of our electricity is coming from wind power. We've got 7% biomass and 5.4% solar, which is quite amazing given it's gray outside. Um, there's a very small amount of coal in there. We've done a huge amount over the last two decades to change the carbon intensity of our electricity grid. Um, that is brilliant, but we have to go a lot, lot further. And that's where government comes in. But we have to, and True made a really interesting point, with what we've seen on um, COVID, people are traveling in different ways. Public transport is low carbon compared to cars, but nobody wants to touch it. So we've seen a spike in uh, car journeys and more polluting secondhand cars being bought. The cars, yeah. um, and so this is where we have to be really empowered with what can we do individually that fits within our life cycle. Not everybody can go and buy an electric car. Um, electric cars are expensive, but you can go and lease an electric car. Can you lease an electric car for the same price as a petrol car? No, but it's a lot more cost effective than trying to buy the difference. And that's where I think public authorities and um, businesses need to start putting more thought into how the right options can be presented to the consumers. Um, and St Stephen, I mean, you know, you, you, entrepreneurial activity you know bang you've you, you've got on with it i mean brand led i mean were they looking for this or is it consumers that you've looked at and gone yeah th they're ready for a for a, you know revolution in in service provision what's you know what what's been driving your example and 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 what would make your example more of the norm more quickly you're mute that's a regular Zoom phrase, isn't it? I know. It happens every time I'm on a call. Um, I think it's both. I mean, we, we've worked on the recycling side for a long time, but we, we know that recycling on its own kind of isn't, isn't enough. Um, we work with a lot of the big brands that we're now working with on loop on the recycling side. And so we, we kind of had, had an opportunity to, to kind of pitch this to them. So what, 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 we, what I always say to, is consumers need to look for the brands that are doing the right thing, but there needs to be more of those brands that are doing the right thing. And I think brands that don't get on board with this with this movement are really the ones that are going to be left behind. And, and I think from 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 COVID, like Truian said, you hear consumers you know, saying they want to make changes to their lifestyle. They're going to do things very differently once we come out of COVID. Um, but I think I think there has to be more brands, though, that are that are doing the right choices. And there is movement on, you know, the, the you know, plastics pack targets for 2025. But it's, you know, it, it, it's it's kind of a slow burner in some cases. But I think uh, I do agree with David on, you know, more has to come from government. There has to be more legislation that brands have to buy into to give the consumer the, the, the I mean, my, my key thing about Loop earlier was convenience. To make reuse um, mainstream, it has to be convenient. And I think it's the same for it's the same for all of these things. People are only going to take these options if they're convenient. If it's difficult um, and not prevalent, they won't do it. Well, I, I can't disagree with you. So, Truant, it's... Is it is it is it a call for government to, to, to make make life a little harder or to facilitate the change a little quicker and then the system will, will roll or have we just got to get on with it irrespective? Well, I, I mean, I know you don't want the sort of like Lib Dem answer. It's everybody's responsibility, but um, <laughs> it's it's different responsibilities. So, you know, we're we're at a crisis point. You need innovation. Innovation doesn't come from government. Innovation comes from businesses that are really stepping out and sort of try, try, trying to go forward quickly. And I think so, you know, the innovative changes, the massive step changes will come from a corporate. I'm absolutely convinced of that. And we're, and we're certainly seeing that. And the, the shift in the economics around sort of the cost of renewable energy, for example, um, shows that, that 
that, that you know, we can make massive change quite quickly. Government's job is to make sure that the rules get tighter and tighter and everybody plays by them. You're always going to get laggard companies, you know, ones that are trying to make a quick buck. Uh, um, and, and government's role is to gradually ramp up the, 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 the bar so that everybody operates to a higher uh, environmental standard. And, and the role for a consumer is two things. It's one, obviously, to, to be resource conscious and, and thoughtful in, in what, what, what they buy. So it's good for their pocket and good for the planet. But it's also to be more vocal. You know, um, it's being vocal to businesses so that that gives them the, the, the drive to create change. And it's vocal politically so that politicians know that, that if they, they sort of try and drop the environment bill for another X number of months, they're going to get kicked by the electorate. Um, and that's not happening at the moment. Fair point. It's, um, it's been interesting. I mean, I, what I think is interesting in, in this space is the amount of media attention that it's getting. And I don't mean, you know, page nine of a of a tabloid newspaper. I mean, BBC One, nine o'clock, you know, a programme looking at the the carbon footprint of a, of a, a of several celebrities dining in a restaurant and we're suddenly realizing that you know local produce and, and you eat it during season has a very different you know environmental impact to something that's been imported out of season from from latin america i mean you know that to me is not the kind of thing that would have been on tv two or three years ago and the fact is that you know with so much more media attention i think people like my mum you know are on a journey of self-discovery around i can live better i can make sensible decisions i want to do my bit and I suppose a number of people have asked about the cost of doing this. And David, you've rightly acknowledged that, you know, le leasing electric vehicles is probably a more affordable way than buying one at the moment, but we've got to change that. And I suppose, Stephen, from your perspective, Loop, Loop is not designed to be terribly more expensive for, for the product you're buying, is it? But there is going to be a small price differential because the system is not the norm. Yeah, I mean, at, at the minute, some of the prices are the same, some are a little bit higher, but the aim is to get the price, you know, the same as, or, you know, in the end of the day, hopefully cheaper. But we need scale. If you think about it at the minute, we're, we're, we're kind of relatively small scale because the brands want to test it, the retailers want to test it, and then the aim is to ramp it up. So um, with the ramping up and, and much larger scale, that's where the that's where the economies of scale come in and the prices will, will lower. So... Um, I mean, the, the other thing Loop does is, at the minute, we, we have a, a range of our own products and we have, you know, big family favourites like Heinz Ketchup, Ecover, Danone, etc. Um, brands and are be, available. <laughs> there's a, but yeah, um, th there'll be a lot more brands coming once we move into Tesco stores as well. That's sure. the thing. Um, and, and Tesco will have its own uh, private label range as well. Um, but I think that's the thing. People, people want their favourite brands, you know these brands are the ones that shift the most units. So to, to really make an impact, you've got to look at the big, the big brands out there. It's not just the small organic brands. It's also, you know, your big family favorites that um, are going to make the impact. Adam, can I just, just pick up a point that uh, Truin raised and just yeah, yeah. elaborate slightly on it. Um, and this is the role of central government and consumers. Let's not forget about local government because actually they are possibly one of the more nimble policy setting uh, bodies. So I, those of you who know me, I, I do a lot of work in Brighton Hove. We've just written their circular economy route map for the next 15 years from an economic development perspective. And what we've tried to do there is put in place policies and actions that the local authority will be able to act as a facilitator to put in place the systems and the processes and demonstrate that local government can do this. And I'll, I'll use one benchmark that we managed to get them to sign up to, which I'm still quite surprised we got them to sign up to. Um, I, I suspect Andy Rees might have something coming up very soon in the Welsh one, but um, Brighton Hope City Council committed to, by 2035, 75% of all of their external spend is going to be on circular economy products and services and that of that 50 percent is going to be from local suppliers wow. that as a statement is really powerful in terms of looking to the long term and setting the direction for net zero which they want to do by 2030 but it also sets a really really clear message to suppliers that that's where they're going to go 
And that will then start to facilitate them being offered more circular, more low carbon solutions. Yep. I, I like that, David. I mean, that's that's really powerful, particularly if you can then get another 50 local authorities in the next 12 months all making the same kind of commitment, because then the marketplace is starting to shift very rapidly. I worry, though, that we're about to enter possibly another recession. Austerity post-COVID, the economy is not what it was. Local authorities have been spending through the roof to keep frontline services afloat during lockdown. Are local authorities really going to spend more in the short term? to make some of this transition happen? Because I'm not sure that my mum, as my benchmark for all good decision-making, often spends more for the right reason in the short term. Um, they don't need to spend more always. And this is where we have to look at it through a different paradigm. As you know, I, I do a lot of work on the construction side. Um, we've, we're, we're just launching as well this uh, next month, a supplementary planning document for new build housing in London. And we've looked at that from the life cycle cost of a block of flats. If we look at how flats are built at the moment, most of them don't have proper recycling and reuse facilities in because the builders meet the British standards and they put bins in the basement. If you design the building for a 50 year lifetime and look at the flow of materials, waste or recycling and reuse, you then build that development so that you can capture those materials on every single day. Vacuum systems, reuse stores, you integrate that into the design of the building and then you've got both the behavioural change but you've then also got the systems in place to be able to manage it. And I, I think this is where we have an opportunity to partner with facilitators, be they universities, be they local authorities, with innovators to actually put in place systems that are going to reduce our carbon, capture all the materials that we need, but also make it really easy for the consumer. It's a lot easier for a resident of a block of flats to walk to the end of the floor and put their food waste in a food waste hatch than it is to go to the basement and try and separate it in a yeah. dirty bin store and they just go, oh, it goes into the, in the, to the trash. So we have to look at everything from that systems perspective. Okay, uh, so a couple of comments coming in about it's time to tell the truth. Um, Truin, is the public ready for the truth and, and sh who should be telling them the truth? Because David Attenborough's tried and I'm still not sure they're all listening. Well, the truth's a bit miserable, isn't it? If we were to be completely <laughs> honest, you know, and uh, the great speech didn't start with I had a nightmare, it started with I had a dream. And, and I think, um, the, the danger of, of, of scaring people is, particularly at the moment, is that they, they switch off, they step away, they feel it's too big, not for them, not now. Um, and, and the thing that constantly frustrates me about the way that the Green Movement has spoken about environmental issues is it's very abstract, it's very distant, it feels expensive, it feels like it's a pain to do. Um, and yet, if we were to talk about it in a different way, um, a greener lifestyle is healthier, you know, more diverse food, uh, more active travel. Uh, you can save yourself a lot of money because you don't have to waste it pumping heat out of your house. Uh, it's better connected. You should be better connected with your neighbours and your locality. Yep. Uh, you should have a stronger sense of self and place. Um, and, and, you know, we've, we've, we've just framed the whole conversation in such a dire way um, and it's left a real legacy of, of how people think about environmentalists. Uh, and it's not a great one, to be honest. Um, and it's going to take quite a lot to bust that myth and change the narrative and change the story to say, actually, a low carbon uh, world is a world where you will flourish and you won't have to worry so much about your house being flooded, you know, or, or, or sort of yep. disrupted food supplies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we just need to shift the narrative because if we keep banging on, you know, if I go to any more environmental presentations with graphs that go up at a depressing bit at the end going, the world is going to end here, you know, that's, that's, that's doesn't get people motivated and engaged. So, so I think people would like to see the truth as long as it was presented in a way that was positive for positive. them and, and honest, rather than a, 
you know, the ice I, the ice age is coming, <laughs> but it was or well, the icebergs are melting sort of tight. I I I, 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 I think that's that's sage words. Tell me, uh, is it time for embedded carbon labels on everything we buy? Turin, first of all, I mean, you know, you're the, you're Mr. Consumer. Yeah. So your mum, you know, who seems to be the most knowledgeable person in the world, does she really go around looking at those labels when she buys food um, to pick out the healthiest one? She, she looks know, for salt content. Salt, yeah, maybe one. But you know, there's a lot of evidence that that even when it's something that's directly related to your personal health, it's things on labels, okay, they're an indicator for a few. They're not going to shift behaviour at any scale. Okay, David, you're, you're no, nodding. I, I, I agree with that, and um, I think it's a really interesting point that Andy raised. Um, we've also already got too many labels. labels on there already. Which one? Which one's the best one? Is 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 uh, a recyclable product the um, uh, the right one, um, or is embedded bodied carbon, or is it actually? Is it better for you to go and get a, a really poor bit of packaging with brilliant food in that is healthy for you, that is less carbon? Uh, now, of course, the answer is to have both doing well, but there's trade offs on all of this. And this is where it makes it really difficult for the consumer. Agree. So what about embedding carbon standards rather than going with carbon labelling? Would that, would that drive the kind of corporate behavior better and therefore consumers only get presented with relatively good choices is that is that something you would support Stephen? i think that's a more logical way of looking at it than, than putting it on, on path um i think it, it's how people interpret things because unless it's unless it's properly explained and that they're not going to know what they're looking at and i do i, I do totally agree with a lot of, of what uh, Truian and David said that you know about how how things are positioned, and turn it rather than the negative scaremonger to the positive. This is this is this is what can happen, yep. and these are the reasons why it's, it's better. But people have to understand what they're looking at to be able to understand any labelling or any messaging. That's the thing. Uh, Adam, you know, a, a carbon tax, you know, okay. if you tax carbon, then you just drive the whole system. Absolutely. Um, that's. I mean, that's. <laughs> That's the way to do it, because if you tax the, the carbon at, at source, then people will change product pretty and, well. And are we as a, a panel of experts comfortable that we've A, got the science and B, the, you know, the, the, the creativity um, in the system to be able to do that without having unbelievable wars between people and brands and, and, and stakeholders about whose carbon is that? That should be a TV show, by the way. <laughs> whose carbon is that? I, that, that's a really interesting question. I would personally think that we've already seen some initiatives coming out of the waste and resource strategy, which, um, including the plastics tax, could be the forerunner for future engagement. And there was a question about EPR, extended producer responsibility. Um, I think if we are going to do this properly, we can't rely always on the consumer to do it themselves. We know the 80-20 rule, and we know that in many cases, it is those that are doing the right thing because they want to do the right thing. There's a significant number who won't do the right thing, firstly, because it doesn't get onto their agenda, and secondly, because they might not have the, the means to. So we take packaging, for example. This is exactly the sort of thing that the producers should be doing. And actually, we shouldn't be telling the consumer whether it's low carbon or anything like that because the producers should have already done that and then it doesn't become an issue and this is where extended producer responsibility should be used to actually get the changes done and then the, then the then the consumer is looking at okay do i get my high fat content that's going to make me really unhealthy or my low fat content either way it's in good packaging and it's good for the environment that's that's the shift that we have to have. Okay, so one of the questions that we were, I asked you right at the beginning was was about where does the responsibility lie, and it seems like government setting the right mandate and then business 
having to deliver you know all good options means consumers can't get it wrong they can make their choices based on the other criteria that, that are important to them at that time and place okay good so that was extended producer responsibility for the person that asked the question um, i don't think it's 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 an answer in itself but it may open up you know a, a portfolio of other taxes and incentives like carbon tax as true mentioned that could change the game so um i've got another question here um, we've got a campaigner on the line. So welcome, Martina. Um, convenience kills the planet. I'm not sure that's a strap line I want to use anywhere soon, but it certainly grabs the attention. I mean, is a deposit return scheme, because I didn't want to go there, but somebody's asked a question. So we've got EPR on one hand, we've got plastic tax on the other. But we're going to go deposit return. The old take your bottles back to the news agent or, or other brands are available. Um, is that going to be part of the answer to this whole consumers making rational decisions and doing their bit or is it just another complicating factor to people trying to recycle what do you reckon Stephen um, it can definitely help I remember I remember the the fizzy pop man used to visit our house when I was a kid um, and that disappeared it's still very prevalent in Germany like like you mentioned um, it, it's going to work for certain products though it's going to work for on the go products you know like like drinks mostly um, and, and while we have a deposit system on our on our system, it's easier to to take those things back, either get it collected or drop it off when you go to a store once, once it's live in Tesco, for example. So it, it, why wider products outside of Loop? Yes, it can work for, for some, but it's I think it is on the go. It's on the go stuff, not not your general stuff at home. Yeah. Uh, Trin? Yeah, it can be, can't it? As long as it's part of a, of a thought through system. You know, as long as it doesn't compete with four or five other recycling systems or trying to do the same thing. And, and you know, where it's worked, it's it's been central to the whole ethos of, of collecting. It's where you sort of try and retrospectively bolt it onto four other systems and then don't get rid of those systems, that it gets a little bit complicated. But on the convenience thing, and, uh, you know, as I think I also am as a campaigner, you know, we've got to stop as much consumption in the first instance. And, and you know, Click, click, you know, being a purchasing online is is a great way to to over purchase. So, you know, if you're buying clothes, you know, you buy five things and then you return four of them. You know, what about the environmental impact of that? That piece of, of clothing, as you've bought it, you bought four of them, knowing you only want one, you return four. So you've got the transport both ways. And then we're pretty certain that quite a lot of that clothing you return is probably being burnt or shredded rather than being repackaged and sent back out again. So convenience is, is links to excessive consumption, excessive spending and environmental impact. Now, that's a really hard message, but I think you know, we've, we've got to change in terms of consumers, that expectation that you can get five things delivered if you only want one and, and you don't even think about the broader impact of it. Um, you know, I think that's, that's where our focus should be rather than on a quite endless conversations about is DRS better than this or that. I, I think that you make a really good point, Trim, because, you know, I, I'm old enough to remember um, Corona bottles in my case, Stephen, and and no, he, the, the bottle man, I wasn't interested because I needed the exercise to go back to the news agent, and that's how I got my pocket money. So, look, healthy lifestyle, entrepreneurial activity, and I was recycling. My God, I was born to work <laughs> in this sector. But um, and Adam, can, can I just, just on that, because... I, I was part of a debate with the um, American University uh, just last year, and we were discussing exactly this point, what's better, store purchase versus online. And this was part of the Reverse Logistics Association. And one of the things that I was actually, we, we were asked to take, not take sides, but argue a point from an individual side. I agree with Truen entirely that there is this huge opportunity to waste stuff as a result of um, online. But we actually started looking at the um, the logistics flow and how you actually look at last mile and reverse last mile collections. Yep. Um, there is potentially a better carbon model delivering directly to the home because you're cutting out the middle person, which is the shop. Um, now, that is an area which is being looked at at uh, a number of places, but I know that ASOS three years ago were getting something like 50% of their products being returned, which was insane. Um, and you're right, Drew, in that many of those have to be disposed of because they have been touched by a consumer and there's a health and safety risk. 
I, th I think it's interesting. You know, I, I remember going to a shop and trying on clothes and working out what fitted me in one store as opposed to what fitted me in another. And therefore what I brought home, I wore. Now we live in this world where like stuff is moving. And I, I think the, the, the answer to that question, I suppose, has been posed. Uh, and the last question I'm going to pose you all, surely a carbon tax that reflected the inefficiency of that number of movements or the fact that you only actually purchase one out of five, if you were having to buy them at a much more expensive rate and pay for the environmental impacts of the logistics system as well, is it would that be a driver to stop some of that willy nilly kind of click and click and buy? I mean, is carbon tax really coming and is it going to be the game changer? Stephen? Well, I think it, it partly depends on, um, on, on your economic circumstances and how much you care about the environment and making a difference. So for some people, it would make no difference. They'd still order 10. They just, you know, they've got the money and they, they, they don't care. But for some people, yeah, it definitely, it definitely would. Is carbon tax coming? Um, it, it's a very hard question to answer. Um, it, 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 would be, it would be good in some senses, um, but how, how would you how would you implement it? How would you legislate it? How would you you know who would be in charge of it? That's that's the thing, I, and it's not something I could see happening quickly. You know, it, it could be another Brexit. It could it could take you know years and years and years and years and years of, of infighting before it happens. I was just reflecting on how long it's taken us to get sort of packaging, um, you know, EPR and DRS and compliance and everything else sorted, and we still haven't finished that. So if 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 carbon's even more complicated, then you know I'll be retired. Um, David, quick word on carbon taxation: how likely and when? I think it is likely. I think it will be relatively soon, but it's reliant on a number of different factors. I think uh, we haven't mentioned it, but. Um, uh, the new uh, president of the United States, I think, could actually have a real influence on some of these factors. Um, it's, it's reinvigorated a lot of the environmental and strategic um, economy. Whether that then gets reflected over the next five years or the next decade, I don't know. But uh, it's definitely a factor. But there's so many other factors that we need to do. And for me, I think there's there's two things that we need to do as individuals. Consume less. And when we do consume, try to consume refurbished. Try to con consume it's repaired. Messages. It's, it's the same sentence. And vintage. And then only vintage. buy new if you can. I'll take vintage. Thank you. Truin, um, carbon tax soon? Never? I think we're going to head towards it. And actually, you, you've called it complicated. It's actually a lot simpler to tax carbon than to come up with a lot of the, the end of the pipe solutions that we compete, you know, completely go around in circles on. And I, and I think it's, I mean, it's got to be because it is, it's going to be price driven. But then there's another, you know, in terms of like um, drivers, you know, air quality as well. You know, if, if people know that those vehicles trudging backwards and forwards are leading to, you know, one of the biggest global killers, which is poor local air quality. You know, if you can get a higher price, a connection with health, then actually, you know, most people want to do the right thing and, and, and they will shift their behaviour. That's a positive point to end on. People do generally want to do the right thing. David's already mentioned we need to go vintage. I love that. Um, Stephen, what's your takeaway message? You're on mute. <laughs> so silence is golden. <laughs> I think I think it's every if everybody thinks they can't make a difference, they can. Even with the smallest thing, the smallest change, you know, like like David said, turning lights on, like look, looking and buying from the brands that are making the right choices and putting the right things on the market, you know, and brands will have to take notice if enough consumers are making the right calls. So everybody so, needs to do that so don't feel helpless. It, a, a little will go a long way. True. And have you got a takeaway message or a soundbite for me? Yeah, if food waste was a country, it would be the third biggest carbon emitter in the world. So the one thing everybody could do is like fall in love with your freezer, don't waste food. You're doing great stuff for your pocket and the planet. Fabulous. And David, your takeaway message is just buy vintage, yeah? <laughs> buy vintage, but understand your carbon footprint and then make choices against that. Go renewable, <laughs> you drive less, and um, yeah, just really understand your opportunities 
Thank you, David. You never respond in the way you're supposed to. You know, soundbite is, is like, you know, 250 characters, mate, not Absolutely. five sentences. But anyway, listen, fantastic. Thank you, audience. Great questions. I think I've answered most of them and the panel have done a good job. Um, panelists, you've been great. You've been honest. You've been uh, punchy. You've generally abided by the rules. Just David, who sort of wanders around a bit um so we've talked about vintage we've talked about biden we've talked about small steps will make a huge difference we've talked about renewables we've talked about carbon tax we've talked about epr drs consistent packaging price points and brands need to step up and government you need to set the right mandate if that isn't enough for a 55 minute webinar then god only knows what we should be doing on these things sweater hopefully we've answered all the all the issues you had on your agenda and uh, and the audience will go away relatively happy albeit um, probably wondering where their lunch is. So thank you very much, everybody, for your time today. Sweater, the floor is yours. Thank you, Adam. I think uh, the audience are pretty much responding to how good the session was. We're getting quite a few messages from them about the number of topics you've covered and the number of questions the four of you have managed to answer. So thank you to the audience. And uh, if you haven't signed up to our newsletter, please go ahead and sign up to it. Adam is going to be hosting, moderating three more panels this year on Be Waste Twice, and you will be updated about it. So thank you all. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Thanks, everyone.